On Health Matters Television for Life, you won't find it in a pill or a program, but there are things that you can do to feel better and live longer. From exercise to eating right, hear what experts say we can all do to extend our golden years. Plus, longevity expert and author Dan Buettner on why time with family and friends is key to reaching 100. Right now on Health Matters. Health Matters is made possible by viewers like you, the friends of KSBS, and by the following. I really liked the idea of being part of Providence, where if I have a question, if there's something that I'm concerned about, I can always call a specialist. I'm Dr. Anna Barber, and I chose Providence because here I can help children thrive and reach their highest potential. If you read Providence's mission statement, it's all about delivering quality care to the patient at all times. I'm Dr. Peter Rinaldi, and I chose Providence because they put the doctor-patient relationship first. Find your doctor online at phc.org. Good evening, I'm Teresa Lukens. According to recent data from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, life expen expectancy in the United States is at a record high, age 81 for women and 76 for men. Sounds pretty good, until you consider that there are parts of the world where people live to be 100 on a regular basis. So why is that? New York Times best-selling author Dan Buettner did some research into that for his book, The Blue Zones. We will share some of his insight tonight. But first, I'd like to introduce our expert panel for tonight's discussion on living longer. Dr. Harold Goldberg is a cardiologist with the Providence Spokane Heart Institute. Dr. Goldberg is board certified in internal medicine. He's also a founding member of Step Up and Go. Laura Martin is a wellness coordinator for Empire Health Foundation. Catherine Van Sun is an assistant professor at Washington State University College of Nursing. She teaches gerontology nursing at the undergraduate and graduate level at WSU. And Dr. Andrew Dill practices family medicine at Rockwood Clinic. Welcome to all of you. Thanks so Thank much you. for being here Thank this you evening. For you. Um, we're going to have a great discussion. We welcome your emails and your phone calls tonight. It's an excellent opportunity for you to become a part of the discussion tonight and to ask our panel those uh, key questions that you wonder about living longer. Dan Buettner was in Spokane recently. We had a, a great panel discussion with him, a community forum. And Dan has a lot to say about living longer. He's done intensive studies on this in the areas of the world, the blue zones they're called, where people do live longer. And I wanna begin before we start our discussion tonight on finding out more from him about what people who live to be 100 actually have in common. Well, the main thing to realize is that people who are living to 100, for the most part, did not try to live to 100. It happened to them. So it wasn't something they tried to do. Something, it wasn't something they pursue, it ensued. It, it was a result of their environment. So if, if you look at their surroundings, number one, typically they live in places where uh, every time they go to a store or to school or to work, it occasions a walk. Uh, they eat mostly a plant-based diet. About 95% of all of their calories come from plants, and only 5% comes from animals. Uh, we, don't, we saw no cow's dairy at all in blue zones around the world. Uh, beans were the cornerstone of every longevity diet, about a cup of beans, interestingly. And we found that people who eat about a handful of nuts every day live two to three years longer than people who don't eat nuts. Any so, kind of nuts? Any kind of nuts. In fact, we suggest that you shake it up because if you're eating the same nut every day, you'll get sick of it and give it up after a month. And I think uh, the key to what he said there was that they didn't try to do it. It was something that happened to them. Um, what do you think, uh, he mentioned some of the reasons, uh, Dr. Dill, that he thought that, but expand on that a little bit. What does he mean by it's something that happened to them? Well, I think the question of the, the walking demographic is interesting. If you look at uh, New Yorkers, they're the only city in the United States that doesn't have an American demographic for illness. They have a European demographic. Uh, the rest of the United States has a problem with obesity, and any immigrants who tend to move to the United States within three years are sitting now at the current American uh, disease demographic. And so uh, from any part of the world, from Latin America, from Germany, um, they eat a lot of rich foods that have um, higher fat contents even than what we eat here. But the thing that they share is a much um, uh, more 
robust uh, activity level. They walk everywhere. Um, you look at um, Asians that eat a higher salt diet with a lot of smoked foods, and certainly there is a slightly higher risk of gastric cancer, but they outlive Americans by far unless they move here, and then they have the same uh, early death rate that we have here. Mm -hmm. And certainly heart disease is the number one killer in the United States, and yet in the blue zones, Dr. Goldberg, very little heart disease. Well, if you have a lifestyle that embraces activity and embraces uh, a rational approach to eating, where I think that comment that was made uh, by uh, Dan talking about Okinawa, where people eat and the, the response before you sit down to eat was a Japanese term that he used, hari hachibu, uh, eat 80%. I mean, when you are a kid, you're, the first thing you hear from your parent is, are you full when you, before you leave the table? And so right away, we are preconditioning children to understand that that's the goal of eating, rather than are you satisfied? And we as Americans uh, tend to be fast eaters. We don't take the time to get the feedback that you're satisfied. And so you see people be give, believe the meal's gotta be gargantuan, the plates are bigger, and so uh, the size that, again, we have accommodated to be normal is clearly abnormal. And we need to figure out a way to modify our our lifestyle and then recognize that it, as what he was talking about is this isn't an event it's not like blooms day you don't just train for it you don't train for just the hoop fest and get conditioned for that i mean it is something that every day you've got to go out and it's not the walk the run of five miles it's the walk every day thinking about the number of steps you have to do and uh, certainly unfortunately as cardiologists we tend to see the end stage of the failure of people to embrace that lifestyle rather than uh, a position of how do you try to stay healthy all the time and not just deal with medicines that after you're sick? How do you, and the cost of that to the society mm -hmm. is huge. Mm -hmm. Well, and that's where your work, Laura, comes in. You work with some of the area school districts. You're starting with the kids, which is where we need to start, to change some of those habits so that they can take those ideas into their families, essentially. Talk about the work that you've done. It started with the Cheney School District. It did. Um, about three years ago, we kicked off a program in Cheney really trying to find out whether we could impact lifestyle changes within <laughs> kids and within families. Um, looking at making some, some definite changes to the way the kids ate at school, changing, switching out processed foods on the lunch menus replacing them with scratch cooked meals uh, using what I call real food um, that that we began introducing fresh fruits and vegetables lean proteins um, low fat dairy into the kids diets and really teaching them that healthy eating can taste good and it can actually be fun to try new things uh, along with that we also knew that Introducing all these new interventions to kids in school was wonderful, but the schools only have them for six hours a day. So we also know that it's very important that we begin, we begin educating our parents as well about the importance of getting active and eating healthy. And so we've really tried to work with our parents real closely in Cheney, um, introducing there's a family night event. We'll offer the healthy food, the same food that their kids are getting at lunch. They're now eating at these family night events, um, teaching parents how to actually cook healthy at home. Because what we're finding is more and more young parents today really don't have a clear understanding of what eating healthy actually means. And they really don't understand that it's affordable as well. So we introduced this program three years ago and uh, it's been very exciting to see the changes across, across that district. Uh, we've seen already a 2% reduction in the mean BMI uh, among a control group of kids that we've been working with. And um, they now, it, it's, it's truly a culture change in that district now where kids come to school and they expect to eat healthy food and that's, that's just a way of life for them now. Do we call it healthy food for the kids or is it just food? Because sometimes labeling it is where we run into a problem. They found that on restaurant menus mm -hmm. that when you start putting the word healthy on the menu, people will skip that, but if you start using words like crunchy and delicious and those adjectives that make it more Absolutely. appealing. Absolutely, yeah, x-ray vision carrots. Um, it, you know, just, <laughs> it, it really is all in how, especially when you're working with kids, the more fun you can make it, the more, more of an adventure that you can build into this, uh, the more they seem excited about trying it. So we do try to shy away from the healthy when we're talking to the kids about it. And, and what, I mean, honestly, what we're, what we're finding in Cheney is we are, we are developing a whole new group of foodies out there where they are excited about trying new things. And if they don't like what they've tried, 
they've realized that that's okay. Uh, you're not gonna like everything that you do try. And they're quick to come to us and say, you know, gosh, if you were to add a little bit more spice to that, or maybe try warming it up rather than serving it cold. So um, they're, they're making some, some wonderful observations about the food and they're open to trying new things. Giving them that power really is something because that's when they feel like they have some control over that, whether they're preparing it hands-on or simply having a choice in the matter. Absolutely, absolutely. So all, all of the elementary schools, middle schools and high schools in Cheney have full service salad bars with fresh fruits and salad, and fresh fruits, salad, they've got vegetables, and there's a wide variety of choices for the kids. And so as kids walk into the cafeterias, they know right off the bat that they have a choice. And so they can choose how many carrots they want. They can choose which of those items that are being offered to them on the salad bar that, that they want to eat that day. And so really you are, you're very much empowering them and they're taking ownership over this. And we're really finding that kids, they understand that they are eating healthier. We don't necessarily call it healthier eating. But they but get it. They get it, <laughs> they, they get do, it. they get it and, and they take great pride in it. Yeah, absolutely. So. And Catherine, let's bring you in on the discussion. You work with an older population in the mm -hmm. work that you do and in your teaching. What is the biggest concern as we age? Um, it, certainly we wanna to try to live longer, but we want that quality of life. So what do you hear from patients? Um, I think one of the major concerns that a lot of people talk about in terms of aging is not making it to 100, but if they are, um, if they're functional, if they can do the things that they wanna to do to engage in life um, and if they, uh, and, and related to cognitive status. So people want to be able to um, engage in life and are, many people are afraid of having Alzheimer's or dementia or something like that. And, and knowing that they, there are things that they can do, such as exercise, which really does help for brain health and um, learning something new, novelty, that engagement with others, learning something, you know, um, read in the paper yesterday, a woman who was 100, celebrated her 100th birthday by jumping out of an airplane. And I don't know if that's how I'd wanna celebrate my 100th birthday. <laughs> it's daring. <laughs> um, but you know, I think, you know, good for her. I think people sometimes, um, that sense of retirement, they retire from life. It, besides retiring from work. And I think figuring out ways to stay engaged um, and not be isolated um, can really be helpful to um, older adults as they age to age in a healthy way and to maintain their function so that um, it can be a rich time of life. So you start with the children and with the parents, but we need to keep doing it throughout the rest of society too. And you're never too old to you know, institute something new with diet and a healthy diet, or 10 minutes a day of exercise. If you can't do a half hour or an hour, you know, every little bit can help and make a huge difference. Yeah, for certainly. People. You know, reinventing ourselves has so much to do with that, mm -hmm. and the exercise component. I t and we mm -hmm. tend to put up those stumbling blocks, but you certainly can. Um, learn new things, you can actually learn, learn a new sport. There's one of the fastest growing sports in the United States being played uh, by seniors, and it's called pickleball, and we actually had a chance to uh, get an up-close look at this great sport. Few activities attract the young and old like pickleball. It's intergenerational. That's the thing I really love. You can play from a four or five year old to a 95 year old. At age 74, Frank Street still has a few more years to play. A fellow I play with is uh, 96 and he says he can get in and out of the car better now. So it helps everybody in a different way. Donald Smithgall credits pickleball with helping him slim down. I've lost 17 pounds. Primarily, I attribute that to playing pickleball. Good exercise. Pickleball is part tennis, part ping pong, and part badminton. It's been called America's fastest growing sport, and it's easy to see why. I love it. Pickleball is really great in that it provides you flexibility, low stress, high energy, loss of weight, lowers your cholesterol, lowers your blood pressure, helps your attitude, and you don't have to be just doing a drudgery to exercise, you're just having a lot of fun. It's that mix of exercise and a good time that keeps people coming back. Carolyn Giltner's been playing since 2005. What got me started was the social, and then I liked the game so much I stayed with it. 
You're out there having fun. And when you get to be our age, you look for some things as well that are enjoyable. The old guys win. Yeah. Fitness and fun for any age. From the game with a funny name. And absolutely, I'm hooked. I've played a few times. Well, I've played more than a few times. I love it. Actually played, uh, my parents go to a re retirement community down in El Centro, California. Pickleball is huge. And you get on the court with some of those older folks, and I'm talking into their 80s and 90s. They're very competitive. <laughs> you do not want to mess with them. But Dr. Goldberg, this goes to the reinventing ourselves, finding things we can do. And that's where Step Up and Go, uh, which is a great program here in Spokane, can come into play also to help people. Talk well, Step about Up that and Go initiative. has been focused, uh, it was organized in 2010 or launched in 2010. And it's a community-wide effort using uh, the partners that have a vested interest in the health in the community, uh, including people from SRHD, Spoken Regional Health District, YMCA, INHS, Empire Foundation, uh, Providence, uh, Sacred Heart, Spokane Cardiology, uh, GSI, and a number of other organizations. And, the goal was to try to create a healthier community to find resources and integrate people and organizations that are already vested in the health and try to challenge people to become more active. And right now the, the signature program is one that's been taken on in other parts of the country called 85210. And it is the focal points of health. And it makes it easy, which is convenient as you think, go through your day, eight hours of sleep, uh, something that frankly as a cardiologist I haven't seen, I don't think. <laughs> 30 years, um, five fruits and vegetables, uh, two hours maximum of recreational screen time. We know that our kids sit there and play obviously tons of video games and it is a challenge for a child today to think about play rather than just formal sports because kids think the only way you really go to do a sport, I remember going to where there was a Hills Resort with my kids, we we're gonna play volleyball and they said, uh, I said, why don't we go play with those people? And they said, we don't know them. I said, well, you just go down and you say, how'd you like to play volleyball? But if it's not organized sport, I mean, we think that basically that it's not something that a kid is going to go out and do. We have formalized recreation. So to get kids away, again away from two hours of recreational screen time and then one hour maximum or at least one hour of exercise a day, used to be thought 15, 20 minutes. I mean, if you can do, and you've talked about the uh, elderly group, sometimes you can't do that. But as a goal, certainly if you can get in an hour of exercise a day, 10,000 steps, and then zero, uh, and that's zero sugary drinks because there are a lot of silent calories that are coming through what uh, we take down as Slurpees and walking around calories throughout the day for children in particular, but certainly adults as well. So right now there's a, certainly a focus of attention of uh, step up towards this issue and the program of 85210. Mm, people are jumping on board? They're embracing it? People are it? slowly embracing yeah. it. I mean, no, it's, it's a process just like anything else. So I think they're becoming uh, more used to it and we'll work going into um, schools and talking about it and uh, going into childcare areas, working just uh, as we've talked about with uh, scratch cooking, also talking about scratch cooking in uh, the childcare area because your destiny is being written by the time you're uh, seven years old in terms of whether or not you're going to become an obese teenager and an obese teenager and an obese adult. So there's a parental obligation to begin to really focus on what am I feeding my child and what's easy versus really what's healthy without using the word as you talked about health. Uh, because what is really good for them in the long run and this whole issue of, we've heard um, multiple people talk about this is the first generation of young children that are not going to basically outlive their parents due to one thing, diabetes and diabetes related to obesity. So there's no question if we're going to impact healthcare costs and the future longevity of this population we need to really be starting to attend to uh, what children intake as really little kids, little, little kids, uh, before they're predestined to become uh, young diabetics. Mm -hmm. Dr. Dill, what are those conversations you have with your patients about simply changing their lifestyle and, and trying to you know, implement the things that we need to do, the sleep and, and better eating and exercise? Is it a tough one? I mean, it, does it come to the point where they're already sick? And you have to do that? We're, we're actually trying now to get our diabetics off of a lot of their anti-hyperglycemic um, medications. And now certainly, uh, as our cardiologist here would, would tell you as well, they do need some protective medications to prevent heart attacks, uh, regardless of their cholesterol numbers. But um, we are able to control probably 50% of our diabetics now without any 
um, medications to lower their sugar. It turns out about 70% of glycemic control in a diabetic is due to diet and exercise, uh, spreading carbohydrates out rather than medications. In fact, all of the medications, including a gallon of insulin, is about 30% of the total control. Um, the rest is up to the patient. So really what we're trying to do is enable the patient to have the ammunition that they need to do the job they have to do. And some of them do require medicines, but um, there was a study done about five years ago that showed um, when diabetics were placed on a pure vegetarian diet, so an ovo-lactive vegetarian diet, including uh, dairy products and eggs, um, instead of meat, including no fish as well in this diet, 50% um, of those diabetics in that long-term study were able to stop all of their anti-sugar medications and still retain normal sugar control, which is shocking. Um, this prevents um, side effects from the medications. I mean, uh, we were talking about this earlier. Some of the medications, you know, side effects are death. Why would you take this? So um, we, we, we're trying very hard to do this. And another problem that people run into is sleep apnea. This is now affecting one out of seven Americans and then one out of three truck drivers has sleep apnea. It has a huge uh, morbidity and actually uh, the average lifespan reduction in an untreated um, sleep apnea patient is 14 years. So that's 14 years shorter lifespan than a person who would either not have sleep apnea or have sleep apnea with proper treatment. Is that mostly due to being overweight? Yes, and there certainly there are cases, 10% are due to things like nasal septal deviations, things like that. There are definitely thin people who have it. Um, but the majority is due to even a 20 pound weight gain can be enough to trip someone over. So in these studies that we've seen, um, or even recently, um, the physical activity, the things you do, it's not so much the medicines that you're on, it's more the things that you do. And even in cases where a statin, say, would drop uh, heart attack risk by 50%, which is an outstanding reduction. Um, I mean, why would anybody want to argue with that? I mean, we want everybody who has risk for that to be on those medicines. And aspirin with a, uh, in women, a 25% average reduction, and in men, a 31% average reduction in, in uh, heart attacks and strokes. Um, these are great ideas for people, but the longevity is not necessarily linked with the reduction in events, which is an interesting thing. Even with obesity surgery, um, there has not been shown to be an increase in death reduction or increased lifespan even with bariatric surgery. Now the complication rate is way down, but they still seem to die earlier because they're not as active. There was a, I hate this title, but um, there was a study done in, in Britain about seven or eight years ago called the Fit Fat Study. And again, I hate the term fat. I think we put enough things on ourselves and to be demeaning that way. But they, they examined people who were at ideal body weight, who did not exercise, had no physical exercise of any kind, but were at ideal body weight, and compared them with people who were 20 pounds overweight and had regular vigorous physical activity. And the overweight group who were vigorously physically active far outscored the non-active ideal body weight group in every measurement measured. So it's definitely, it is, it totally is. I mean, when you think about the, the tests our cardiologists would do to examine a patient, they, they're running on a treadmill, seeing what their heart can do. I mean, this is the test of your system. Why would you not want to be in shape even if you had the genetics to get a heart attack, wouldn't you want to be a marathon runner shape to survive that heart attack? So exercise really is the key in this case. Are we too quick, Catherine, to want to turn to a pill? I, I think our, our culture has become that way, that we want it to be a quick fix. And if it's not a quick fix... It's too hard to get in shape and eat right. It, yeah, it's, it seems that yeah. way. But I think, it, again, it's, it's one step at a time and um, you know, realizing that we, we do have to put some work into the quality of life that we want to have. And many of the things that we are asking to do or are recommended to do by research isn't um, overwhelmingly difficult. And I think doing one thing at a time, I mean, for the last five to seven years, I don't think my husband and I have ever eaten on one of the larger plates. I only serve the point. luncheon plate, period. And that's, we haven't, I, the plates are sitting up there and I'm thinking, I should just toss them, I don't <laughs> use them. So Thanksgiving is coming. So I think I might keep them, but, um, but you know, I, and I keep thinking of all the little baby steps and I'd hate to think what our life would be like if we hadn't done the baby steps. But again, it's just one little thing, just changing your plate taking a walk, you know, doing something simple. And then most people who do take medicines, although we want a quick fix, 
adherence to medication is abhorrent. So people really don't want to take medications either. Um, they want a quick fix if they're not feeling well, but um, there's a lot of problems too, though, with getting people to take blood pressure medication regularly, mm -hmm. et cetera. And I think those who don't like the medicines, it's like, well, let's drop the weight, increase your ac ac activity, and maybe you won't need the medication that you don't want to take because people aren't taking them either. Right. They want a quick fix, but they're also not taking mm -hmm. them. Well, let's take a phone call this evening and, and bring some folks in on the discussion. Susan from Coeur d'Alene is calling. Good evening. Yes, good evening. I'd like to make a couple of points here. Uh, you like what you are raised with. I have been underweight, but not because I'm, you know, dieting. I can run a 10-minute mile, and I'm in my late 60s. I have no medications or anything. But there are a lot of myths floating around, and the gentleman touched on one that all thin people are healthy. But I want to touch on a few others. Uh, low fat, I found a lot of low fat, you know, packaged, I don't eat packaged foods. Low fat foods are high in sodium. Then the gluten-free, uh, you know, kind of craze where, you know, unless you have celiac disease, uh, there's nothing wrong with 100% whole wheat eaten, quote, in moderation. And a lot of gluten-free foods are filled with chocolate and sweets and sugar is the killer. But getting back to you like what you're raised with. If parents would raise children, I don't like soda drinks. I was never given them. I don't like anything sweet. I, because from childhood, my father was kind of a nonconformist, uh, but he was ahead of his time. You don't like what you're not given. I don't like ice cream. I don't like cake. I don't like candy. And as far as exercise, I, you know, enjoy getting out and transplanting trees and sawing limbs off, maybe a little dangerous, but uh, I've done it all my life, and I enjoy that. Um, I enjoy the foods that I had as a child, and I don't like sodas. I don't like rich, creamy foods make me sick to my stomach. So you do like what you're raised on, which goes back to um, educating parents and students uh, at this point in time. The other thing is everybody's sedentary. I can't stand sitting still. True. Not because I'm nervous. True. I just love exercise. I've been out pickaxing and planting trees and but I've done it all my life. I enjoy exercise, and uh, so it isn't a chore. But again, how children are raised from babyhood, they will like what they're given. I eat when I'm hungry. I have no idea what I weigh, probably the same as what I weighed 20 years ago. Okay. So well, that's Susan, a you make some excellent points, and certainly uh, that's where the work that uh, Laura does comes into play, starting at the ground floor, starting with the kids and sort of setting the groundwork. And in fact, when you started this in the Cheney School District, the resistance you got was not from the kids, it was from the parents. Absolutely. I, I think more often than not, I think adults in general have bought into this myth that kids and vegetables don't mix. Um, they, they really feel that if we feed a kid a vegetable, they're just not going to eat it. So I'm not going to waste my money in buying that, that fruit or that vegetable. Um, and I think there's a lot of confusion out there about what they should be, what parents should be feeding their kids. They understand, well, okay, I should feed them fruit, they should get some vegetables, but they don't like it. So um, when, when we launched this product it, it, or this program, it really was uh, the matter of convincing the adults that this was a good idea. I think philosophically they understood that, well, sure, kids should be eating healthy, that, that makes sense. But we don't want to be wasteful. And so it, it, took, it took us a good solid year of, of really working with the parents to get them to understand that if through persistence, through patience, um, and, and through making it fun for the kids, they actually will change their minds and they actually will accept fruits and vegetables as a snack um, and, and as something good to eat. And, and I, I can't tell you the number of times that I've had been stopped in the grocery store or at, or at a you know, local basketball game or football game and had parents coming up to me and saying, okay, we eat jicama in our house now. <laughs> and it's because I didn't know you. what jicama was yeah, before you exactly. came along. Yeah. So which I, I think is exactly, exactly what we want to see happen. Absolutely. And in fact, it goes to, we, we all know we've been told a hundred times what we're not supposed to be eating. I think we know that list quite well. A lot of it is uh, sugar and, and salt. So what is it we should be incorporating into our diets to make us live longer and healthier lives when it comes to eating right? Well, dietitian Patty Seebeck with Spokane Community College's After Dark Culinary Program joined me in the kitchen recently for a lesson in some superfoods. So Patty, we hear a lot about superfoods. 
and yes. the fact that we're supposed to be incorporating them into our diets. But what does it mean when I say superfood? Well, it was a great question to ask because there's a variety of opinions um, when I went out online to see what they thought. So basically you're looking for foods that give you the most for your money. And the simplest way to think of that is a little exercise that I often do with my culinary students. And I give them a dollar and I say, go out and find me the most nutrition you can, can give me for a dollar. And then I give them another dollar and I say, go find me as many calories as you can. And what you find is they find two very different foods. So they might find me 12 hostess pies from a thrift store, or they might find me a whole bag of lentils that's just packed with nutrient density that has fiber and protein and all different kinds of vitamins. And, and there are some also. great superfoods, I there guess, are. and tasty ones. We're going to show off six of them today. Yes. Starting with lentils, which you just mentioned. I did. And we are the lentil capital of the world, just south of us. And they come in a variety of colors. So we have the traditional brown ones that a lot of people pick up, but there's yellow and green and orange and they're all loaded with protein and fiber and you want fiber for diabetes and heart disease and just slowing down um, transit time of blood sugars rising and making things move through our systems a little quicker as we age. So is a lentil a bean? It is. They classify them as legumes. Yeah. It I falls into say, that yeah, category, which we're supposed to be eating more of. Yes. Beans. Okay. Yes. Let's talk about quinoa. This is another um, hot item right now. Yes. That gets butchered in terms of how to pronounce it, but quinoa is the right way. And it's a whole grain. So you're able to just um, cook it for 10 to 15 minutes in its natural state and you get that whole, whole kernel. And that's what you want for, um, just has more nutrient density and more fiber in it, more protein. It's Yeah, it's one of the few grains that actually is packed with protein. Is true. that correct? So great for vegetarians. True, true. But all grains do have protein in them. Okay. So, but quinoa would be a little higher. All right, another grain is oatmeal, another nutrient packed food. You know, grandma was right to send you out the door with oatmeal in your tummy. Um, and it again, because anytime you add fiber to a food, it's going to slow down the transit time and just keep you full for a longer time. And um, oatmeal is just the perfect food to be able to do that. And you can add nuts and fruits and just to even make it more nutrient. -based. Is it true too that it can help lower cholesterol? Yes. Um, there's two types of fiber. There's soluble fiber and insoluble. Um, oatmeal is a soluble fiber. And, and the way I think of it is if you put it in water, does it dissolve all the way? And oatmeal for the most part almost does that. Sometimes they're a blend. Um, and soluble fibers lower your blood sugar and lower your cholesterol level. All right, one of the superfoods that I have a little bit of a problem with is sardines, and, but we should you, be eating more of those. You wanted me to bring salmon. <laughs> and it's really, it's the same thing. Yeah. But you know, sometimes it's a price thing. So sardines can give you just as much of the omega-3 fatty acids, and it's a little over a dollar a can. So and add them to salads, take them hiking with you. Um, it's protein, it's calcium, it's got all the good fats in it. Does it matter whether I have in oil or in water? It's a, a caloric difference more than anything. So if somebody cares about calories, water. Okay, let's talk about kale. This is actually something I've been eating more of and I actually like it. You know, it can be a little intimidating just because of the texture. It's so different than a romaine or an iceberg lettuce. So if you chiffonade the kale, you cut it in little tiny ribbons. And the first time I had a kale Caesar salad that way, it was just so much easier to eat and so much prettier on the plate too. So it's great, it's loaded with vitamins, fiber, color. And speaking of color, pomegranates are a great superfood and they're beautiful, but they're hard to eat. They are hard to eat. My mom used to eat them in the football stadium and I don't know how she did that. You can put pomegranates under water after you cut them open and actually kind of wiggle the seeds all out underwater and, and you don't get red stuff all over your shirt. And then the white stuff floats up and the seeds go to the bottom and you just scoop them out. And they're great to have in a salad or just even on their own. Oh yeah. And just, they have twice the fiber of blueberries. I mean, blueberries could be considered a superfood too, but I think pomegranates even more, especially their time of year is a little tighter. So.
I think putting the pomegranates underwater was the best tip right. that I got. How brilliant was exactly. that? Because those seeds can be so hard to get out and so messy. Uh, Laura, the, you were nodding your head through quite a bit of this. You recognize some of those superfoods. I do, and you know, actually lentils, lentil chili is one of the most popular menu items in the Cheney School District. Uh, it's, it's asked for again and again. Yeah, so. and, and you know, for those families too that are, and kids and, and folks that are on a tighter budget, they're very economical too. Absolutely. Absolutely, to absolutely, and, and that's part of what we try to do in Cheney too. Is is you know, we introduce the kids to the food on the lunch menu, and then during those family night events, we'll teach the families how to cook them. And we also have taste test programs that we provide recipe cards home to, to families as well. They're available electronically and in paper form with recipes, simple recipes that have, um, it, it can fit any, any family's budget um, where they can start cooking these same foods at home um, that the kids are eating at lunch. Being social is one of the key components. In fact, Dan Butner said that the number one reason people live to be into their 90s, 90s and 100 years old is that they have a sense of purpose. And I thought that was, again, so telling about how we treat our seniors in the United States and the fact that we tend to be spread out as families, our, our parents don't live with us anymore, our grandparents, and we just have a whole different dynamic going on. And in your work, Catherine, do you find that uh, with the seniors, that, um, that they've sort of lost touch with their friends or family when they get to be a certain age? Yes, I do think that happens, but I think another reason for that is, um, in the United States and in many industrialized countries, but we really suffer from ageism, which we're trying to stay young. We have all the creams, we have all the, we just don't want to age. And so what happens is that we have a lot of attitudes and um, things that really disengage us even subconsciously from older adults. It's uh, one of the things when I teach gerontology, that nursing students need to have time in clinical settings to learn about older adults. But those clinical settings means that it's the nursing home and the, you know, and they seeing the frail older adult. And so when I have lectures, I make sure that I show them the other 90% of older adults that are doing yoga and running marathons and doing all of those things. And people are surprised. People think that if you get older, you're going to be frail in a nursing home, unable to think or do for yourself. And so I think that really facilitates our belief about aging and older adults, facilitates that isolation, that social isolation that we do happen to see. And so there's more things that need to be done to bring that together on the Blue Zone um, dot com website. They have a project where they have young students, elementary kids, find an interview and spend time with somebody who's over the age of 80. Um, and I really like that exercise because it helps to the older person engage in life, but it also helps the younger people see that older people are living and paying, p playing pickleball and doing all kinds of things. But it, especially in some arenas in the world, and in our society, we really just have a very negative view of older adults and what they're capable of doing. And I don't think that's helping that engagement that they need to grow old yeah, in a good absolutely. way. Yeah, absolutely, which is commonplace in places like Japan and areas of Greece where we're finding Mm -hmm. that they're still connected to their families. They yeah. embrace the knowledge and the, the mm -hmm. years um, that they yeah. bring, you know, and that they can share with the younger generation instead of, you know, yeah. casting them aside. Now if we see an older person who does something, we're like, oh, well, look <laughs> at that, what a surprise. And you think, no, actually there's more people doing that than you think, but it's that we are a very ageist society. And it's something that I think it will be our undoing if we don't address it. And uh, Dr. Goldberg, you have patients that, in fact, you treated one recently that is 100 years old, um, a woman. Right. So uh, just last week, we uh, had the opportunity to change her pacemaker at age 100. And, How long uh, had she had the first one? First one was probably uh, seven years ago. And uh, it had been implanted in a night where we were what, attempted to be implanted in an evening where the electricity went out due to a windstorm. <laughs> oh, and uh, she and I were there the next morning at 6.30. And this time at uh, age 100, she said, you know, 
as I was getting ready to change her pace, she said, I've checked the weather report today. And at first I walked in, I said, why does it have anything to do with the weather report? And then she was the one who was recalling that uh, seven years ago we had to cancel our pacemaker. And she did get to celebrate her 100th birthday recently, and I saw the picture with a 102-year-old brother. So while we talk about is this really um, environmental, uh, certainly there are genes that uh, contribute, obviously, to living a, a, a long life and living in to be a, a centenarian or a centenarian. Um, and one of the points you made, though, about uh, adults or the elderly is, you know, the, again, how do we value them? And often we don't value them. And part of it is their, their lives really are connections to family, but we have such a spread out society. The, where are the grandkids when you talk to a patient? Well, they're all living a state away or several states away. And it just seemed to me that we could have uh, many programs in not just to interview um, adults or elderly patients or elderly people, but to really engage them in uh, reading and reading to kids because there are so many kids who don't have that, particularly in inner cities, that support or that time to have um, someone helping them. And even if you're not beneficial of, because of joints, able to do something at age 85, you, if you still have your vision, and a lot of our patients have macular degeneration, but those who don't could certainly be reading with them, and while reading with them would also be sharing lifestyle stories and mm -hmm. creating this bond between um, young children and, and adults that's lost in our society. And giving them something else to do also, which yeah. again goes to that purpose of a reason to get up every morning yes. and have something that is meaningful to do that is important to you and again going to a, a longer life. Well, Dan Butner is the uh, author of Blue Zones, which is sort of how our discussion got started tonight. And he offers uh, nine reasons or nine ways that you can live longer. Number one, set your house up so you're nudged into movement. Uh, number two, know your sense of purpose. Number three, develop some, some rituals every day that allow you to de-stress, whether that's taking a nap or happy hour. Uh, feel free to drink a little bit every day, two to three glasses of wine, eat a plant-based diet. Uh, use the, the rituals we know work to keep you from overeating. Eating a big breakfast, for example, works. Investing in your family. If you have a religion, stay engaged with your religion. That's worth four to 14 extra years of life expectancy. And the big one, mm -hmm. know who you're hanging out with. We know that if your three best friends are overweight and unhealthy, you're about 150% more likely to be overweight and unhealthy yourself. So curating a group of four or five friends who nudge you into eating right and staying engaged and staying active, hugely important. Dr. Dill, would you like to expand on anything he said? I love the comment about staying engaged and hanging out with people that have common interests, but also that you want to sort of you know, move your life forward and, and together you can do that as a group. Well, I know um, one of the um, ancient myths of the Chai Chi immortals, if people are familiar with Kung Fu movies, there's a myth of uh, people that are experts at Tai Chi that live forever. Well, the, there's actually uh, truth to the myth. Um, it's really actually not a myth. Um, in ancient China, when Tai Chi was first starting, um, there were um, monks who were practicing Tai Chi who were experts at martial arts who lived into their 80s and 100s at a time when the average Chinese citizen would die at 30. So this would be like a person today living to age 300. Um, the um, Tai Chi studies have shown an improvement with um, bone density and we use, we prescribe it as a treatment for a lot of things, stress reduction, anxiety, depression. I prescribed that this week for a patient and um, for those reasons. It's also an excellent treatment for osteoporosis. The ancient Chinese saying about Tai Chi is that uh, a person who practices Tai Chi has bones like iron wrapped in cotton, which is stunning. And this, is, this knowledge has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years, over a thousand years. Um, and so this is a highly social activity involving multiple people. Yoga is very good for a lot of things. I personally do it for a low back discomfort and find it very helpful. But Tai Chi is actually perhaps a better system because it involves multiple people in a group setting. Um, it encourages you to go. It's not hard to do. The injury rate with Tai Chi is exceptionally low compared to other sports because the movements are very, very slowed down. Uh, so anyone at any age can practice it. You could even practice it in a wheelchair, frankly. Um, you can practice it with a cast on your leg. It's highly effective social interaction with a lot of other people. Um, if you've never tried it, I would strongly encourage at least five minutes with a tape of it. It'll change your life. It is quite slow movement. So to look at it, it doesn't look like you're doing an exercise. It can be extremely hard. Yeah. Um, the, the difficulty 
um, is self-set. Um, the higher you stand, the easier the activity is, and the lower you sink into the motion, the lower you bend your knees. It can become extremely hard, uh, and so you set your own level. And the more people do it, the lower they tend to go. And that is extremely taxing on the muscles, actually, and causes a great improvement in muscle mass, bone density, cardiovascular health. Wow. Um, it's, a, it's a stunning um, form that's been around forever. And for older adults, it can reduce the risk of falls because yes. they maintain their balance and because of the bone density and the way that they go from a broader to a narrow um, base of support. That's right. It's, so. it's a physical therapy um, mm -hmm. regimen that's used to treat actually vertigo. Mm -hmm. um, I actually use it to treat vertigo myself. So. Yeah. And, right. and it can Very be effective. adapted, which is what you were saying, Catherine, you know, mm -hmm. because we tend to put up these stumbling blocks. Well, I have arthritis or I mm -hmm. have bad knees, but this is one way, another way, a choice mm -hmm. that you could make mm -hmm. where you could adapt it. Exactly. And I think there's a lot of things that can be adapted um, depending on what your current physical ability is, function is, um, resources are in terms of budget. I think, you know, it's just really finding a way and I think um, you know, finding how you might be able to adapt it and having a social support together, you might be able to figure out, oh, you tried it that way, that might work for me. And that really helps the, the thinking expand between you um, to come up with ideas on how you might adapt it for yourself. Mm -hmm. And Dr. Goldberg touched on, on how kids now, Laura, are so used to organized activities, so used to organized sports, they've forgotten how to play or never learned how to play. Mm -hmm. My mom would open the door and we would leave and we'd get called for dinner. But that's not the case anymore. And there's some safety issues, you know, with kids running around the neighborhood, but they've sort of forgotten how to play. You're trying to incorporate that more into your programs also. Absolutely, just, just as important as the nutrition side of things is, we're really trying to teach, teach kids how to play again. I mean, it really is pretty amazing. They, the games that I grew up with, kick the can, um, you know, tag, tag outside, yeah. <laughs> just, just simple games that we all grew up with, kids today aren't familiar with. And so we've, we've developed some structured recess programs where we bring in students volunteers from Eastern Washington University who come in and actually teach the kids how to play again. Um, our after-school programs are the same way where, where we're just trying to teach them that you don't need to spend hundreds of dollars to go out and be part of a team. It's, it's just as beneficial and just as much fun to go out and grab a group of kids at the local park and a can <laughs> and, and just go run around and, and have fun and play. So it's, it's so very important because we, we do, Dr. Goldberg, you mentioned, I mean, our, our kids are glued to, our, to their TVs nowadays. They're glued to those joysticks and that's where that entertainment is coming from for them. And so it's, it's really very important, very crucial to their health to get them up and get them moving. And if we can teach them these games and these skills again, then hopefully they will then teach this to, to their children one day. And, We'll, we'll continue. If not to mom and dad. If not put to mom and dad. Put down the phone, put down the computer. Absolutely. Let's go outside and run around, take a family walk. Well, Absolutely. Part of the problem with this like that. organized sport is we basically hold on a pedestal performance. Mm -hmm. And so if you're 13, and it's, it happens by the time you're 13. 13, you're either in select this or super mm -hmm. select Club that. This and, and we have yeah. said, you have talent and you don't. Mm -hmm. And it, therefore, sport becomes really this ticket theoretically to the scholarship and moms and dads I've been standing on school fields for many weekends and going to many different places in many different cities where basically play was basically just to do that, to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. And so we really need to get away from the idea that sport is just for those who succeed. And the kid retreats, that's why they retreat, because you're already told, you know what, some, the, some, those, those statements are made either overtly or covertly that you don't have the talent. Well, it isn't necessarily about talent. It's about just go out and enjoy the game. Mm -hmm. And so we need to figure out a way to restructure. Or just the fact that we have to even say that word, restructure our approach to play. <laughs> Sadly, yes. Right? That's an anathema right there. Yeah. Well, I think yeah. unfortunately in the school environment too, uh, you know, recess and, and PE programs are becoming cut. It's, it's more and more common that they're cutting those. And all the research shows that if we can get kids up, we can get them moving throughout the day, that stimulates their brain and that's, mm -hmm. that's only going to benefit them in the classroom. And so I really think that just as important as teaching them to read and write, it's, it's important to teach them how to play, how to incorporate movement throughout the day. Um, it, it's going to be benefit them from an academic standpoint, but it's also going to benefit them from a health standpoint. Mm -hmm. And well into adulthood, because Absolutely. if we do that as kids and we don't have those more structured 
structured, you know, I played basketball in high school, well, I can't play basketball now, well, I can take a walk or jump on my bike. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, things that we need to be incorporating at a younger age that they can take into adulthood. We hear so much about inflammation, and we're not talking about, you know, visible inflammation, but internal inflammation and how hard it is on our bodies. Dr. Goldberg, talk about what we're talking about when we say inflammation is creating, uh, wreaking havoc on our bodies and how we can minimize that. Well, I mean, we talk about inflammation of blood vessels as uh, the trigger to heart attack. And uh, sometimes we measure, although we've had some falling away from measurements indices of inflammation of the blood vessels, did you have a high HSCRP, a num number that was given up to, to blood vessels. I think that's falling a little bit away at the present moment. Um, so I would say that uh, presently uh, there's less attention to that than there was in the, in the recent past. And I think we're just presently looking at um, cholesterol numbers. You talked a little bit about um, and how do we basically deal with cholesterol numbers? I certainly know cardiologists and cardiac surgeons who take the pill and say, well, now I can go eat. And so, I mean, we need to basically still figure out a way to, to incorporate lifestyle so that your cholesterol numbers, frankly, are not going to be at the type of level that uh, is leading to coronary artery disease prematurely. And I think it's, it's achievable. And certainly Europe is the model. When I was, one of the reasons we helped uh, develop Step Up Spokane is you go to Europe and you see right away, there's just, you look around and people on the street, you almost step off the street and you almost get run over by, by a bicycle. And it's a woman taking her kid to work. And she, uh, or going to school, and she's got the two or three kids on a bicycle, one in the front, one in the back. And she's got a long dress on, and this is just part of lifestyle. And we need to figure out ways to incorporate these lifestyle changes so it's not an event and uh, begin to see people who are thinner. You walk, you, the model, of course, in this country is two thirds of people are overweight or obese. So you look around and you say, well, I don't have a problem. I look like everybody else. And if you're in Europe, you look around and the model is totally different. So you just have to, we've got to start to really think, how do I create this healthier um, concept for my children? Because if I don't, if I don't do it myself, uh, we've just, we've been talking about that, then you're, you are basically modeling for your kids Every day, if you don't think going for a walk is important, your kid's not going to think going for a walk Absolutely. is important. Absolutely. Well, one thing the studies have recently shown with standing, I saw an article on Yahoo, and I hate this type of title, you know, gray is a new black, but they called <laughs> sitting the new sleep apnea, which I was, you know, thought that was interesting, or walking is the new superfood. I, I really don't <laughs> get the analogy. Or we're making those connections. Right. But the, the studies on, 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 on sitting actually show that that is an independent cardiovascular risk sitting all day. Uh, in fact, uh, sedentary office activity um, increases the risk of diabetes by 12% and increases the risk of obesity by 23%. Even if I'm working out at the end of the day? Uh, yes, all right. Well, really? actually, actually not, not with the physical activity okay. included, no. But sitting all day actually is as bad as eating uh, high calorie, high cholesterol food. It's as bad in some studies as smoking. It's as bad as sleep apnea. Uh, which sleep apnea is extremely dangerous. So um, this is, you know, we, we've actually sh switched to a lot of models where people stand. I, I typically stand in the patient exam room, actually wear hiking boots so I can stand longer without my feet hurting. Um, and that's been a shift that we've had. Um, and standing actually burns calories at a much more rapid rate than sitting, even something so simple as that. The other thing is um, we talked about energy density in food. And that's actually, you know, it's a good thing to have something that's energy dense, but it can also be a really bad thing. For, for example, if you look at a plate full of broccoli, it has the same calories, all carbs, they're all carbs in broccoli, but it has the same number of calories as one cup of cooked rice. So that's shocking, the number is shocking. So when you think of, you know, how many carbs can I eat, you know, in the palm of my hand level, I had a patient one time tell me he could put a, bit, a dagwood in there, <laughs> uh, I mean level. Um, that's the, the number of carbs you should have three times a day and that's specifically a diabetic diet but actually it works for everyone and the concept of the plant-based diet is really the Mediterranean diet which is basically um, red meat one serving a month fish one serving a week not all day and not all week and then um, eggs one serving which is two fried eggs basically uh, or boiled eggs eating the whole yolk and everything a week and the rest of the time no meat at all and only vegetable products. Um, I know that, that, that we talked about lentils. I didn't realize we were the lentil capital, which is really <laughs> cool. My family, my, even my, my uh, two and 11 year old will eat lentils all week long if my wife cooks uh, lentils because they're wonderful tasting. 
um, and uh, they're very easy to get kids to do. My son um, will pass up um, a piece of chicken or a grilled cheese sandwich piece for, he, he's two, for uh, romaine lettuce pieces. He likes the way they crunch. It's just, I mean, it doesn't have to be the typical. But it's um, because you're bringing him up that he way. He loves them. He'll sit there and eat them all day long. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and it is about establishing those habits and changing some of the ways that we look at the behavior that we already have. And here's what Dan Butner from Blue Zones had to say about that. It's shifting the focus from, from individual responsibility to really thinking of the city we live in. And what are all the ways that we can make the easy or the healthy decision easier or unavoidable? And if you look at the academic literature, there's about 150 little things you could be doing. I'll give you a good example. Okay. Schools. If your children go to a school where kids can eat in hallways and classrooms, those kids on average are 11% fatter than a school where there's no eating in classrooms and hallways. So guess why that is? They're snacking too much. That's right. And what are they snacking on if they're... Uh, chips and candy. and Exactly. So yeah. that little policy change costs nothing. It doesn't rely on government. It doesn't rely on employers. There's no tax. But it's setting up that default so that a healthier choice is easier. They eat breakfast, lunch, maybe a snack, and then they go home and eat dinner. To your work, Laura, we're already running short on time, so I want to get some final thoughts from, from each of you, sort of a, a culmination of what you think, um, how we can live longer, sort of encapsulated in, in one thought. Catherine, we'll start with you. I think it um, one step at a time, and it doesn't have to cost a lot of money. It can be inexpensive. It doesn't have to take a lot of time, but one step at a time, and you can be successful. Quit think of it, of it as a huge undertaking. Yeah. Move forward one thing yeah. at a time. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Dr. Dill. Well, we talked about this earlier, but the one thing in the studies on um, people who've lived to past 100 is that every one of them was capable of laughing at themselves. In fact, no one that lived to 100 didn't have that habit. Excellent. Excellent advice. Dr. Goldberg. I think with regard to slow changes, uh, start simple, you know, meatless Mondays. Because for a lot of people, what you described it is a huge leap of just a plant-based diet. So if you start with something and then you begin to sample it and recognize the fact that uh, you are basically, as a parent, determining what your children are going to do and be a model in terms of exercise, the value of exercise, and uh, that two hours of screen time, recreational screen time a day, that would be a great uh, limitation for kids to begin to find something else they got to do with the day. They better start moving and, and play can be fun. It doesn't have to be a sport. Mm -hmm. And finally, Laura? Absolutely, I would echo exactly what Dr. Goldberg, Goldberg said. I think, I think I would just challenge parents to get up off the couch, turn off that TV, and get out, find things that you as a family enjoy doing together. Um, and, and, you know, sampling healthy foods can be fun as well. So look for a way that you can, you can make it fun. Don't push a plate of broccoli in front of your kids and expect them to eat it right away. Make it fun. Uh, make it an adventure for them. And I guarantee if, if you continue with that, they will, they will eat it they will accept it. And our kids and all of us will live longer and better, which was our topic tonight. Thank you again uh, for being here. It was a wonderful Thank discussion. Thank Thank and you. that's gonna do it for this edition of Health Matters. We are back on December 11th, when our topic will be keeping active in the winter months. We'll just continue the discussion. And if you'd like to hear more with my interview with Dan Butner, the author of Blue Zones, you can go to ksps.org. We have posted the unedited version that you can watch there and a number of links that you can uh, use to get more information about tonight's show. For all of us at KSPS, thank you for tuning in. I'm Teresa Lukens, and good night. Health Matters is made possible by viewers like you, the friends of KSPS, and by the following. If you read Providence's mission statement, it's all about delivering quality care to the patient at all times. I'm Dr. Peter Rinaldi, and I chose Providence because they put the doctor-patient relationship first. Find your doctor online at phc.org. I really liked the idea of being part of Providence, where if I have a question, if there's something that I'm concerned about, I can always call a specialist. I'm Dr. Anna Barber, and I chose Providence because here I can help children thrive and reach their highest potential.